Today the time of my sermon is no peace, no God. If you have your Bibles, uh, or you can look up on the wall, the Bible says in Romans 5, 11, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be together, to meet around the Lord's table today, remember Jesus, to fellowship together, to shake hands, and just to be among this crowd, this wonderful group of people. Thank you for them, Lord. I thank you for everyone here today and pray that they'll receive a blessing. And I pray for those outside of Christ that they'll come to know him today and repent and be baptized and wash away their sins and become a brand new creature before they leave this building. Be with us now, guys, as we bring this message in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you ever heard the way Jewish people greet one another, but they say, Shalom, Shalom. Which it means peace, a, great, uh, a, a greeting of peace. When you look at the writings of the New Testament, you know that you'll see that this greeting is used many times. Paul would start his letters sometimes with these words, grace and peace be unto you, as he begins or ends maybe one of the letters he written he wrote. You know, when Jesus appeared in, to the disciples, after the resurrection and they were hiding from the Jews in John chapter 20 verse 19 and verse 24 he says twice peace be unto you or peace be with you so uh, Jesus was a man also who wanted us to have peace but you think about what greater desire could man have than a desire for peace what greater gift could we wish for than to have peace, or for you even, an individual person, someone to have peace. But I'd like to point out that when I talk of peace, I'm not just talking about the presence or the, uh, I'm not just talking about an absence of war, because a lot of times when we think of peace, we think of peace treaties and we think of war, we think of peace from fighting. But I want to talk about that peace that only God can give. It's also possible to be in situations of great turmoil, yet still have peace in our hearts and peace in our minds. And it's also possible to be in the calmest of all situations and have no peace inside of us. So peace is something we all seek. And the peace I want to look at today is to know peace if you know God. The peace I want to look at today is is peace with God. The absolute trust toward God. I want to ask you a question today. Do you absolutely, positively trust God with every aspect of every part of your being? Do you absolutely trust God? And you know, when you absolutely trust God to get you up in the morning, to put you on your feet, to get you walking, to get you driving down the road or whatever you're doing to say, God, I trust you. I know you'll be with me whatever I go through. It is that state of absolute trust toward God that I think can bring peace to your hearts and to your mind. It is also the absence of fear as regard to our relationship with God. In other words, we fear God because we're told to fear God. But we know that we have a right relationship with God that we don't have to fear what's what's coming up because when he comes back, we won't have to worry about that because we have trusted God. You know, Jesus says to his disciples, these things have been spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. He said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer. He said, for I have overcome the world. Our God is a God of peace. Our God is a God of uh, who offers the gospel of peace. Now, you know, some people confuse peace with man with peace with God. Now, there's a difference. Some people confuse peace with man with peace with God, like the man who said, although he hadn't come to church, in a long time that he said, I can look any man in the eye 
And God knows I've done nobody wrong. Now he is confusing peace with men and peace with God. I read about a fellow who went to the police station. He was trying to get arrested. He said, I want to turn myself in. Now, why he wanted to turn himself in, I don't know. Somebody said he was trying to get away from his wife. But anyway, he said, I want to turn myself in. I'm turning myself in for murder. And the police say, well, sir, you, we have a lot of unsolved murders, but we cannot find your fingerprint on anything or any weapon. He says, then, if we had no proof that you ever committed a murder, he said, then, try me for bank robbery. They said, a lot of banks have been robbed, but we can't pin anything on you. He said, then try me for making moonshine. And the police said, we've broken up a lot of steals, but none of them were mine. Uh, none of them were mine and, uh, that, that we broke up. We can't find one that belongs to you. We can't find any moonshine steal that belongs to you. Then, one by one, they checked off every crime that this fellow had committed. Finally, they checked his profile on the computer and found out that he did get a ticket for running the red light. But they said you paid the $125 fine, so you are clear, mister. We can find no reason to arrest you. Now, we would come to the conclusion that this man, by this example, has peace with his fellow man. He's never committed a murder. He's never committed a robbery. He's never drunk or uh, tried to moonshine him for a living. He's never done anything. So his, his, as far as humanly human possible, or as far as the world is, as we say, this man has peace with his fellow man. He's done no wrong according to the law. We can stand with American flag on one side and the Christian flag on the other side, and with our hand on the Bible, and can solemnly swear, I ain't mad at nobody. I have peace with all men. Now, but peace with man, and, and what I'm trying to get across to you by this illustration of these illustrations, peace with man is different than peace with God. If a man appears before God without obeying the gospel and says the same thing, I'm not guilty of any crime. I've never committed murder. I've never committed robbery. I've never done anything wrong in my life as far as I can get arrested for. And I can lay my hand on the Bible and I can stand between the American flag and the Christian flag and say, I ain't mad at nobody. I'm not guilty of any crime. And if you think you can do that, and you think, well, God will have plenty of evidence that I'm a good man, therefore I'll go to heaven, you're wrong. God will have plenty of evidence against you. God knows you. And why I say this is because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're not innocent. You may be innocent with mankind and you may have peace with man, but if you're not obeyed the gospel, you do not have peace with God. You may have never been in jail, but think about this. You may never even think about some of the things that you'd like to do to people, but the Bible says it's not all, it's in the heart also. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, indicated that guilt is found in the thoughts as well as the act itself. He says in Matthew 5, 28, if a man looketh on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery in his heart already. So even a lustful look, God can find evidence against you. As a man, the Bible says, think it is his heart, so is he. So peace with man. Is not the same as peace with God. If you want peace with God, you got to obey His Son, Jesus Christ. You have to repent of your sins. You have to confess His name before men and be buried with Him in baptism, to rise and walk in the newness of life. If you want to know peace 
and know God. Paul tells in Romans chapter 5 that we can't have peace with God. We can know peace and know God. Let me tell you, as Christians, we have peace because of the hope that lies within us. We have peace with God because of hope. Now, Romans 5, 2 through 5, it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this the grace when we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, and knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh us not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And now, these verses give us the divine progressive ladder of peace. A ladder that climbs rung by rung and the summit is hope. We have access to God by faith. He mentions tribulation, then after tribulation. Tribulation leads to patience. And then patience leads to long-suffering or steadfastness. And then patience leads to experience and approvedness. And experience leads to hope. The bottom line of this divine progression is hope. We have a hope that we don't have to be ashamed of. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Remember, he said, now by faith, hope and love. These three, he said, abide. Faith, hope and love are at the heart of the Christian life. Our relationship with God begins with faith, which helps us to realize that we're delivered from our past by Christ's death and his glorious resurrection and then our obedience to him. Hope grows as we learn that all that God has in mind for us, it gives us a promise of the future. And, and now we have become the friends of God and God's love fills our life and gives us the ability to, to reach out to others because we have hope in eternity and we want others to have hope. We're not ashamed of that hope that lies within us. He says, now by the faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. One day, we won't need hope. One day, our hope will be outlined for us. One day, our hope will be revealed for us. When we get to heaven, we won't need hope. Hope will be done away with. But now we have peace because we have hope. We have hope that we're going to see the streets of gold. The street of gold. We have hope because we're going to see the river of life. We have hope because we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. Amen. The world needs to hear of this hope that Christians have through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have peace because of forgiveness. That's another reason. We have peace. You know, Paul said, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. That's you. Christ died for us. By the obedience of the one shall the many be made righteous. Forgiveness is Paul's theme here as he writes in Romans. The power of sin is given to us in no uncertain terms. Listen to this, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You've sinned. I've sinned. We've all sinned. And the Bible says, if you say uh, you've not sinned, you make him a liar. Think of the power. Now, I want you to think just a minute. The power of one single sin. It just, took, it just took one sin to make the world a graveyard. If Adam had committed no other sin but the one sin of eating of the forbidden fruit, that one sin was enough to kill the whole human race. The venom of the old serpent is more deadly than we can imagine. One bite... And one sin. And because of that one sin. That one sin. All of us have to die. After the law came in. We could see the power of sin. <coughs> Topladi. You don't know Topladi. I don't know him either. 
but I know that he's the man who wrote the song Rock of Ages. He said that the average person who is 20 years old has committed in the neighborhood of 630 million sins. Wow. The average person who is 50 years old has committed in the neighborhood of 1 billion, 500 million sins. Good Lord, wonder how many Jerry and Rogers committed. Uh, I don't know. Think about Bobby Ray, Lord mercy. 200 billion. You know, I don't know how he figured this out. I really don't. But he just made that statement. I, I can't vouch for his accuracy. But let me ask you, how many sins have you committed? You know, if I say if you start to count and you can remember them, you can't stop counting because you can't count that high. But think about it. If one sin of Adam could kill the whole human race, what would be the results of my sin? Of ten of my sins or ten of your sins? Truly sin abounded. But here's the good news. Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Oh, we should praise God for His grace. We should sing about the amazing grace of God. Grace did much more abound. Because of sin, we have to face death. But because of the grace of God, that one billion, five hundred million sins that I committed is gone. Because of the grace of God and through the rashness of Jesus Christ, he took all those billions of sins and laid them on the back of Christ through His grace. Because of Christ, we have eternal life. We have peace with God because of forgiveness. I love the verse in Romans 5, 7 and 8. It says, For scarcely for the righteous man one would die. Yet prevent for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The amazing thing is while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. You remember the old song? The song, I know you do. Peggy's favorite, the old rugged cross. No, I'm sorry. I messed up. It's not the old red cross, but it's the song at the cross. But if you remember the song at the cross, at the cross with the Savior, one line says, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Now, some of the song books have changed it to such a worm, such a one as I. I heard a preacher recite that song and use the worm version. He told me, he said, a very sophisticated woman met him at the door and said, Sir, I'll have you know that I'm not a worm. You know what he should have said? No, lady, you're more like a maggot. <laughs> uh, because that would have been a better choice of words. Because we're the lower in the worm. We sing, would he devote the sacred head for such a worm is I. After all, when Christ died for us, He died for us as sinners. We were not children of God. He died for such a worm as me. I don't mind going fishing, putting my hand in the can and pulling out a big wiggly night crawler and putting him on a hook, but boy, I wouldn't like to put my hand into a bucket and pull out a maggot, would you? But I have not over-exaggerated sin. The picture of sin, when you consider the power and awfulness of sin. But in due season, the Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 6, for when we're yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
And that was me. And that's you. Christ died for us just in the nick of time. Just in the right time to save us from hell. If Christ died in due season, it says in due season, due time for you, it may be that if you were baptized into Christ this very day, it would be in the nick of time. And the only way to have peace with God through forgiveness is because of forgiveness we have peace with God. And the only way we can have peace with God is to be even forgiven of your sins and receiving Jesus and obe being obedient to Him. Peace. Thirdly, we have peace because He lives. We have peace with God. Peace with God. We have peace with God because of hope and forgiveness, but we also have peace with God because Jesus lives. Romans 5, 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Think about that. We're saved by His life and His death. Jesus intercedes for us. He goes to bat for us. He is at the right hand of the Father on the throne of God. He is our advocate. He is our lawyer. He is our go-between. He pleads our case toward the Father. We have peace because Jesus lives. You know, when the devil accuses me and, and he wants me to sin and he wants to destroy me, I can just say to him, Hey, devil, take it up with my lawyer. And he'll say, Who's your lawyer? And I'll say, my lawyer is Jesus Christ. The devil will back off because Jesus is my advocate. He is my talk. He talks to God for me. He's my intercessor. Because he lives, I have peace with God. You know, there was a time when death reigned over all. In Romans 5, 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even all over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come. Death reigns over all. You know, Butch and Janice were talking the other day about how many funerals they've been to in the last week and a half. And we think about death reigns over all. Nevertheless, death reigns from Adam to Moses. Even babies have to die. Death reigns over them. I have and you have been there too. And we, we've all been there. We have been there when we've had graveside funerals of little bitty babies. That died just after it was born. You know, we were talking the other day about the epidemic of polio. And years ago and some of the, the childhood uh, epidemics that killed children. My dad had five brothers and sisters and you can go up Forge Ranch right now in the cemetery, and there's one, two, three, four, five that died from four years down. All died because of childhood diseases they didn't, didn't know, polio, dip, diphtheria, and other things. Maybe I'm not sure, but they all five died. But anyway, even, you know, I preached Timus Bartley's funeral. Anybody know Timus? Remember him? He was 104 years old. I preached his funeral. Death reigns upon all. A baby has not sinned, yet it dies. Not because of its sin, but because who? Because of Adam's sin. We all have to face death, but because Jesus lives, and he promised me that because he lives, I can live, we can have peace with God. And we can be justified through Jesus. Now folks, I can be saved because Jesus lives. That is peace. I have peace that I can be saved because my Jesus defeated death. Paul says that our peace with God comes because of we have been justified by faith and His grace. You know, as long as we're convinced that our salvation depends on our own actions, as long as we think that we have to do something to be good 
enough for God to save us, then we'll never have peace. And a lot of people don't obey the gospel because they think you have to be perfect. If we live our lives with the idea that one little slip up and we're zapped, we have, we've lost it, then we can never have peace with God. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fail. We all mess up. If we say never, we never made a mistake, boy, we're bad shape, aren't we? I made a mistake this morning. I give Kenneth Blue Robinson a baptism certificate that said Randall Blue Robinson last week. Now I got it. I don't know why. I make mistakes. I sin. And I think that our salvation, if we think, if we think that our salvation depends on a perfect obedience, the perfect will will not be a part of our lives. We will never be perfect. We'll always have the doubt if we think we have to be perfect to have salvation. We we'll ask ourselves, have I done enough? Did I get everything right? But folks, when you see the love of God that would reach out to the sinners and the ungodly that would send his son to die for his enemies, then we can have peace. We can have the hope of glory, the hope that does not disappoint. The Bible says we have peace with God because Jesus lives and because of our faith in him. Romans 5.15 says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift, for it's through the offense of one many be dead. Much more, listen to this, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which was Jesus, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, had abounded unto me. On an award show recently on TV, one man made this statement. He said, life was a losing game. He said, no matter how interesting it was, no matter how wonderful life was, no matter how many adventures you've had in life, he said, everybody's life ends the same way in death. He said, life is a losing game. You know, he don't understand what life is all about. Life is a winning game for the child of God. We're on the winning side. And because he lives, we shall live. We can have peace with God. When we have peace with God and know that we have peace with God, we can take whatever the world sends our way. We can weather the storms of life with the anchor we have. The hope that peace of God gives us. No peace, no God. Some haven't found it yet. Some haven't found that peace. If you've not joined your life to Christ's life by being baptized into him, you don't know what peace is. Without the trusting faith that says, here I am, Lord, I'll do whatever you say, then you can have not peace. It can't be done. No peace. No God. You need to put your faith in God. And part of that is putting on your Lord in baptism. The Bible says when we're baptized, we put him on. We put on Jesus. Our salvation is through faith. Through a living faith, an active faith, an obedient faith. Baptism does not add something to our faith. It's being obedient to faith. If you're not a child of God, will you come as we stand and sing our invitation hymn?